Good to see you, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, good. Well, let's go on in. Uh, why don't you join with me as we read our scriptures for this morning? Go on to stand to your feet. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. While we're turning there, go on and turn the person to the right and to the left of you. Tell them this is good to see you. Glad you're here. Good to see you. All right. Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 12. It reads as follows from the NRSV. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horab, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked. And the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, well, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, to the Hivites, to the Amorites, to the Perizzites, to the Hivites, and to the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites have come up to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to the Pharaoh and bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I'll be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Pray with me, church. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being with us, for us, amongst us, between us. We thank you for all that you are. We pray in this time we might see you. Remove the preacher from this moment, but let us hear from you. Let us see beyond the veil into the supernatural, beyond the natural into the supernatural that we might experience, encounter, and be encouraged by your word for our lives in daily living. In the name of Christ, we do pray. Amen. 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 Well, if I had a title today's message as you're taking your seat, I'd simply call it the God of Extra and Ordinary. The God of Extra and ordinary. Some of y'all know some extra folks. Yeah. Don't, don't look at them. Just go on and blink five times if they're sitting right next to you. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. We all know some people, some people that are a little, just a little extra. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was 17 blinks. That was, that was 17 blinks. That was a confirmation, right? Well, if you take seriously uh, the scriptures, right, that say God will never leave us nor forsake us, that God will always be by our sides, well, then this means that you understand that God is with us in our highs and in our lows. This means that you understand that uh, the king of kings and things between is always active, attentive, and available. You understand that uh, the God that sits high also looks low. You understand that um, 
that God is present in the mundane and also in the extraordinary. And if, in, and if many of you are like me, you can even attest to the fact that your life may be relatively ordinary, relatively ordinary. That's not to say that it's boring, but or that it's filled with melancholy or without the occasion of spice and excitement. Matter of fact, just this week, I was flipping through some pages and got a paper cut. <laughs> excitement. <laughs> yeah. I squeeze that, I squeeze that lemon too afterwards, and that was a lot of excitement. You start, you start cutting them lemons after them paper cut. Whoa, my God. Excitement. Something wrong with me. But we're used to routines. You could admit that your life is filled with some routines, right? You wake up in the same bed every night, you go to the same job. You get out the same bed, you put the same two feet on the side of the bed, you walk down the same hallway, you go into the same kitchen, open up the same refrigerator, drink the same orange juice without getting the cup. I saw that. <laughs> Close the same refrigerator door, get, get ready, you get, in, you get in dress, you get into the same car, you back out the same driveway, you get on the same road, you go down the same street, you get to your same office, you sit at your same desk, you type on your same keyboard that you ain't cleaned in five months, that's nasty. <laughs> you open up the same emails, then you make the same phone calls, you, you walk in the same halls, then you go to the same place for lunch with the same coworkers and the same people, then you go home after the day and you get in your same car and you, and you drive on the same road and you get into the same driveway and you close the same door and you sit on the same couch and you eat the same five meals or so, right, that you always eat, it's the same ones. That's why you buy that big old pack of chicken, because you know you're going to have the same meal. Then you sit on the same couch, you watch the same TV, you burn notice. It's one of my shows I like to watch. I started watching, uh, what was that? What was that weird show we watched it, Senior? What was it? It was some weird show. I shouldn't have watched it as a, as a, as a, as a preacher. It just didn't, just my, just my spirit didn't sound like, ooh, this ain't, ooh, this ain't good for me. <laughs> then you go to the same bed and you sleep in the same bed and you wake up and do what? The same thing all over, all over again. You see, all of us in some ways, we are used to the ordinary experiences, the reoccurring experiences. But if you're like me, you have more ordinary experiences than you have extraordinary encounters. And to some extent, let me not be wrong, we all want this. We all want to have routine, right? We want stability. We want a sense of dependability. But, but there is one thing that I've realized in my relatively short life. And that is this, that is that every day is ordinary until it isn't. Every day is an ordinary day, a day full of rhythm and routine and regular until it's not. Every day starts out the same, the same 24 hours, the same 60 minutes, the same, the same seven, the same seven days. Some of y'all seem like Derek, there's not 60 minutes in, in a day. I just couldn't count that fast. Okay. You know what I'm talking about. Multiply. <laughs> Odessa, Texas. Odessa, Texas. It was a regular, ordinary day until it wasn't. September 11th was just an ordinary day on the calendar until it wasn't. 20 children and six teachers went to Sandy Hook Elementary School for an ordinary day of teaching, education, and exploration until it wasn't. Sandra Bland and Philando Castillo were engaged in routine, ordinary traffic stops until they weren't. Skittles and iced tea were ordinary after-school snacks until they weren't. 
You were having that ordinary conversation with your coworker, your friend, your loved one, until you got that emergency text, that emergency phone call, that emergency email, and all of a sudden, nothing was ordinary about that day anymore. And when ordinary moments in our lives are interrupted by something extra, extraordinary, this is when we desire to hear from God the most. We want to know what God has to say about the extra moments of our lives. And there's nothing wrong with that. Hear me again. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's what happens after a while. We become conditioned to believe that God only speaks to us in the extraordinary moments of our lives, the unplanned moments of our lives, the ones we are unprepared for. And as a result, we've grown used to listening closest for God. Once we've hit rock bottom, once we've discovered a lump on the x-ray or a spot on the x-ray or experience a heartache so devastating, we just realize how much we need to hear a word from the Lord. And again, I say there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with wanting to hear from God in those extra moments. But this is precisely why I love this passage. You see, because in this passage, we discover that God is, ju- is not just present in the extra God is also present in the ordinary. God's not just the God of of the extra, but God is the God of the ordinary. That's my first point. God is present in the extra and the ordinary. God is present in the extra, in the ordinary. You see, in the third chapter of Exodus, we pick up in the midst of Israel's great and prolonged enslavement. There are 400 years of oppression. This is 400 years of tyranny, of terror, of chronic trepidations. More than 400 years of lost hope, denied dreams, prayers that have seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. But the Bible says that in the midst of all of Israel's great suffering, God spoke to a very complicated person a very very complicated person in a very very ordinary way in the midst of all of that trepidations fear turmoil terror God speaks to a complicated individual in a very regular mundane ordinary way you see the story of Moses is a complicated one because When Moses was a baby, Moses was adopted by the Pharaoh. And this means he had grown up seeing people that looked like him, lived like him, loved like him, being mistreated by the same family that had taken him in and nurtured and cared for him. Moses had grown up seeing seeing folks that could have easily have been him being mistreated and oppressed by the same folks that nurtured him. And after witnessing his people suffering for several years, Moses grew more and more aware of just how unjust his surroundings were. And the Bible says, and the Bible shows that as Moses then begins to grow up, he begins to uh, tap into uh, some of his raw characteristics, this, this, this raw and this untrained and this untamed disposition that he had towards righteous indignation and holy anger begin to play out in various aspects. He was, he was, maybe he was struggling with some, with the fact that he, you know, all of this trauma between being this kid that was put inside of a sea and having to grow up in a community that wasn't like his and being talked about but 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 somehow all of this anger begins to play out in Moses's life and even at one point the Bible says that Moses struck a man he struck a man and killed him and the Bible literally says that Moses looked this way and that way and when he didn't see anybody he buried him in the sand he looked this way how many was the last time some of y'all looked this way and that and that one and that way Yeah, Saturday night, Saturday nights. You look this way, you look that way. (laughs) Moses' story even goes on to be a little bit more complicated. Moses is seen breaking up a fight then between these two Israelites. And unbeknownst to Moses, uh, they actually saw him look this way and look that way and bury that body in the sand. And once he broke up this fight, they said, what, Moses, are you going to do to us the same thing you, you did to that, to, to that Egyptian man? Moses' story gets even more complicated. The Pharaoh then finds out that Moses has committed this murder, and he seeks to have Moses executed. 
But however, what, what does Moses do? He flees like an escaped convict and goes into a place called Midian for several years to, ex- to escape. And even while he's out there escaping from, uh, from uh, Pharaoh and he's there for, uh, for seven years, Moses is now in Midian and he sees seven women that are soon to be taken advantage of and Moses steps up into the situation. You see, needless to say, Moses was a complicated individual. Can, any, can anybody relate to having a complicated life, complicated personality, a complicated uh, disposition? You know, one of the things that folks often tell me when they find out that I stutter, they say, Derek, you know, Moses uh, stutter. I say, you know, this is what I do. I, I look at them and I know they're trying to encourage me. I do. I, I know they're trying to encourage me. And I say, you know what? That's not the only thing we got in common, though. We complicated. <laughs> we com- Look, I yes, y- 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 yes, I y- 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 yes, I do stutter. But I got a few other things in common with Moses too. I know I'm preaching a three-point sermon today, but you cut me off on a Monday. I got a one-point sermon for you too. I oh oh oh, I'm 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 complicated. I'm I'm complicated. <laughs> I'm complicated. Slap your neighbor high five and say, "Hey, pastor's complicated." <laughs> Past is complicated. Past is complicated. Right? It's complicated. But what I love about this story is that God even calls Moses. Moses, this complicated Moses. God has a God has an extraordinary encounter with Moses. An extraordinary, ordinary encounter with Moses. Let me explain. You see, the Bible says that Moses was leading his father-in-law's flock of sheep uh, through the desert when he noticed that a bush was on fire, a burning bush, a bush that was burning but not consumed. It was not brought to ashes. You see, what most of us don't understand is that a burning bush in the middle of whole, whole, uh uh-huh, yep, there Moses, in the middle of Horeb, would not have been an extraordinary sight to see. Matter of fact, it would have been very, very regular, very basic, benign. It's normal. There's nothing crazy about it. You see, because after all, this land in which Moses is in, Horab, it literally means desert, desolate place. So a bush spontaneously combusting in the heart of the desert would have been a normal occurrence, a regular occurrence. A wildfire wasn't a strange sight to see in the desert. But here is something I want you to pay attention to. Notice what Moses says when he sees the burning bush. Watch this. Here it is. It says, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Verse 3. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. Check it out. You see, in this instance, we learn a valuable lesson from Moses. And that lesson is this, is that God is present in the ordinary, the ordinary moments of our lives, all aspects of it, in our relationships, in our daily commutes, at our workplace, in our homes, in our classrooms, in our cubicles, in our going in and in our coming out. God is present in it all. But in this passage, Moses does something that few of us do. He investigates his ordinary experiences. What Moses does is he sees an ordinary sight and he decides to stop off the road and look at this regular thing. Oh, come on church. When's the last time that you stopped and looked at the regular blessings in your life? 
When's the last time you stopped and looked at the fact that you woke up this morning and said, oh, I might be in the same bed. I might walk down the same steps. I might look into the same refrigerator and sit on the same couch and drive the same car and get into the same office and go to the same lunch and get into the same car and go back to the same house and sleep in the same bed. What Moses does is he looks at the regular Moses stops and looks at the regular and discovers God. Moses stops and looks at this regular burning bush and he discovers God. When's the last time you asked yourself how God has been revealing God's self in your life? When's the last time you took inventory on the activity of God in your own story? Church, if you want to hear from God, you must be willing to investigate the ordinary. If you want to hear from God, you must be willing to investigate the regular, the mundane, the routine. If we believe that goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life, we've got to stop and turn around every now and then and see what's goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy. This brings me to my second point. My second point, God is always available. God is always available. Notice, if you will, uh, verses three through five. The scriptures say that once Moses turns his attention to this ordinary bush, he hears the voice of God. Verse three, then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush does not burn up. Keep going. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. You see, when Moses turns his attention to the ordinary, he hears the voice of God the intimate voice of God that calls him by name. And matter of fact, God calls him by name twice, which is an indication of intentionality and of intimacy. And what is Moses's response? Here I am. You see, here is my second point. God is always available, but I have a question with this point. Are you? God is always available. That's the point. But the question is, are you? Are you? You see, when Moses investigates the unordinary, he hears from God. And when Moses hears from God, he makes himself available and says, here I am. And when Moses makes himself available, God removes the veil between the natural and the supernatural and reveals to Moses that the very place where he is standing is holy ground. Did you see that? It says, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. God says, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. You see, when God, when Moses rather, decides to make himself available, God removes the veil between the natural and the supernatural. And Moses discovers that this whole situation This place that he's been walking in undoubtedly day after day, month after month, year after year, walking these same sheep on this same street. But once he encounters this bush on this particular day, after making himself available, after deciding to investigate the ordinary, God turns around and reveals that just behind this curtain, oh, you didn't know it, but this whole thing right here has long been situated and inhabited by the presence of God. I want wonder how many of us in our own stories can take a sit can take a step back and discover that God's activity has always been present in our lives in those moments that we don't think about it even even in that little that little bad butt kid it's not even your kid it's your neighbor's kid and they throwing them rocks over your face oh I just had a flashback I just had a flash 
and they hit your window. God is present even in that. God is present all around in the regular. Moses decides to investigate the normal and he discovers the supernatural. You see, this reveals to us that many of those moments that we think are mundane without incident and easily overlooked as minuscule or minor, well, they may actually be significant and filled with the presence of God. In other words, even the ordinary can be holy. Even the ordinary can be, can be holy. Church, I wonder how many opportunities we've missed with God because we didn't believe um, they were extraordinary enough. Church, uh, I wonder how many people have missed the call of God because we felt we were too basic. We were too regular. We didn't have the degree, the accolades, the name of recognition, the posture, the status, the friends. We felt we were too mundane. How many encounters with God might we have overlooked because we didn't think that so-and-so mattered? So we refused to make ourselves available to them when all the time God was using them. Notice what God says to Moses next, verse 6. He then says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. You know, actually, I think about it. I once had a burning bush experience. I was about seven years old, and I decided that I was going to have a barbecue. This is a true story. I remember in my apartment complex, there was this little wooded area, and I was going to have a barbecue, and I got some matches off the laundry place, lit up the the matches, put some leaves together, got some ground beef outside of the refrigerator. Ooh, I was bad. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And I remember lighting those bushes on, or the, uh, you know, the leaves and bush on fire. And then as I lit it on fire and I just watched the flame go up, I saw the presence of God. <laughs> and then I got distracted. I took the hamburger beef, I threw it down there. Because, I, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm seven, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking, thinking this thing all the way out. Took the hamburger beef, threw that on the tree. I was like, okay. Then I heard this voice. I said, hey. I said, God, God, God. <laughs> that was my burning bush experience. Turned out it wasn't God. There's a woman behind the fence on the other side. And she said, hey, hey, what are you doing back there? Put that out before I tell your mama. Hold up. (laughs) I said, hold up. Wait. I remember I said, look, you don't know my mama or my daddy. True story. True story. True story. True story. Facts. Facts. No alternative facts. It's a true story. I said, you don't know my mama or my daddy. I let that thing back up. Yep. I, um... I was done playing with fire. I went home, smelling like smoke, got in the house. My mom was there. You know, it's funny. I don't remember what happened next. I, I really don't remember. But I remember Thursday. Thursday, I discovered that apparently she did know my mama and my daddy. You see, I tell this story because here in this instance, we see we see that God says, I'm the God of your father. 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's, a, it's indicative of a relationship that has spanned time in generation. It's indicative of the fact that there's a legacy to this. And it's also indicative of the fact that God has been up to something in your life long before you were even in imagination, long before you were somebody's thought or held in somebody's arms, long before you walked the earth on your own two feet, long before you scraped and scratched your knees, long before you experienced that deep, deep heartbreak, long before you developed that lump, long before that family member walked out on you, long before you didn't get those grades that you wanted, long before you were bound by debt, long before you had that record, God has been up to something. And God says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham. Oh, my God. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. This thing that I'm doing in you has history, has a legacy. You may not be able to see it fully play out in this day, in this time, but I've been up to something. God has been up to something. And more so, God is intimately aware of our particularities. God is intimately aware of what our capacities are, of what our wrongs doing are. Mind you, God still calls Moses knowing that he is a murderer. This brings me to my third point. An encounter with God is often an opportunity for change. Check it out. An an encounter with God is often an opportunity for change. You see, let's take a look at verses 7 through 12. You see, these verses speak to God's commissioning for Moses to fan into flame the call that God had given him. Let's take a look at verses 7. Let's look at 7 and 7 and 10. Then the Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have seen. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. I have heard. I indeed know their sufferings. I know. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land or out to a land that is good in a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I also have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come. So come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. You see, the operative words in this section are, I have seen, I have heard, I know, I have come. Check it out. It's right there. I have seen how they've been mistreating you. I have heard of what they said about you. I know. I'm aware. I'm I'm omnipresent. I'm all-knowing. I'm in all of this, and I have come. But then watch what happens. After reading verses 7 and 8, you almost are led to think that God is going to show up like one of those Avengers from, you know, like end games. It's about to be on like Donkey Kong. (laughs) But instead, when we get to verse 10, there's a plot twist. And God says, so come. I'm sending you. Check it out. God says, I've seen, I've heard, I know I'm coming. So I'm sending you. You see, this brings me to my third point, right? An encounter with God is often an opportunity for change. You see, God has positioned Moses to serve as a vehicle through which the children of God will gain their freedom. But that's not all. God has positioned Moses to be the very evidence of God's presence. I have seen, I have heard, I know, I come, so I'm sending you. Moses, in this instance, then becomes the evidence of God's presence. Church, 
I got to tell you something, something. You are the evidence of God's presence. When you show up in your community, when you show up in the marketplace, when you show up at that board meeting, when you show up at that school, when you show up for that one that's down and out, when you show up, you are the very evidence of God's presence. God is choosing even you. God is using you as the conduit of grace. God is using you as a disseminator of compassion. God is using you as a healing and restoration in that bomb in Gilead. God is calling on you. I've seen, I know, I heard, I come, I'm sending you. You see, when Jacob got in God's presence, he was no longer the same. When the disciples entered into God's presence, they were encouraged, they were compelled, they were changed. In church, you've been now positioned to acknowledge the, the ordinary circumstances of your life. And you're now being invited to participate in being the presence in the evidence of God in somebody else's life. You see, most of us, or rather, uh, Moses is like many of us. Even we, even uh, we experience a move of God. We experience a move of God, but Moses does what all of us do at times. After we have this great encounter, after we have this, this mind blowing, this mind opening experience, then we've got questions. Did that really happen? Did that really take place? Did I, did I, did I, did I really take? I don't know. But what Moses does is, watch it here, here it is in verses 11 and 12. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you. Notice, Moses says, who am I that I should go? God says, I will be with you. Check it out again. That is the most shadiest response on the face of the earth. Moses says, me, I can't, you, but you know I stutter, you know I got this. God says, I'll be with you. Shade, shade, shade. The Lord, the Lord gave Moses shade. Moses, Moses is, a, is, a, is essentially affirmed in the fact that he's not qualified. God says, yes, Moses, you actually don't have the capacity. You don't have the resources. You don't have the skills. You don't have the credentials. You don't have the title. You don't have the accolades. You don't, you don't have the resume. You don't, you, don't, you don't have it all. But I promise this. Nothing plus me equals everything. Nothing plus me means you can make it through this. I know where you grew up. I know who your daddy is. I know who your mama is. I know your whole lifespan. I know the life cycle theory. I know the trauma that's there. But look, nothing plus me equals everything Church, you don't have the degrees. You don't got enough degrees. You don't got enough on your resume. You don't make enough money. You don't, you don't have it all figured out. But I've come by to tell you this morning that nothing plus God equals everything you need. Nothing plus God equals everything you need. Nothing plus God equals everything you need. Oh, God doesn't call the equipped. Oh, God equips the call. God doesn't call you because you got the qualifications. God qualifies you because you got the calling. Oh, church, I feel like preaching this morning. You don't need to have it all worked out and figured out. What God requires of you is that you would simply take a pause to pay attention to the ordinary. And when, when you start looking back and tracking back over the history of your experience, you discover that, yeah, you didn't get the degree. Yeah, you don't have the accolades. 
But what you did have this whole way through is the providence of God seeing you through time after time, day after day, moment after moment, minute after minute. And that is enough for God to say, you think you can make it, but I've been with you this whole, oh, this whole, this whole time. The points. God is the God of the extra and the ordinary. The second point was God is available. Are you? The third point is that an encounter with God is an opportunity for change. I believe we had an encounter with God this morning. And this is an opportunity for change. Won't you stand to your feet? When, when Moses looked at this burning bush, he decided to pay attention to this ordinary thing happening on. And when he paid attention to that ordinary thing, he experienced a God that knew him by name, that was intentional, intimate, aware, and concerned. He said, Moses, Moses. Moses' response, he didn't ask a question. He didn't say, who me? He didn't try to get all this stuff figured out and get everything situated and put together and then enter further into conversation. What Moses did is the same thing that I'm encouraging you to do this morning. Come on, come, come, come on, listen. It's the same thing that I'm encouraging you to do. To simply say, here I am. You don't have to have it all figured out. After Moses made Moses' self available, God worked it out. But Moses had the calling and the responsibility to simply be available. So church, when we open up these doors and we make this call, I want you to say your, your, your name, Sarah, Sarah, Jason, Jason, Ru, Rebecca, Rebecca, here I am. Ladies and gentlemen, beloved friends, dear church, the doors of the church are open. Won't you come? Won't you tell God, here I am? Won't you come? Won't you come? If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. God sees you, God sees you, God bless you. You can use anything. Is there somebody else brave enough, courageous enough to say, here I am? The Lord's been speaking to you all week. Investigate those ordinary moments. The Lord's been speaking to you this whole year. The Lord's been, been with you from generations to generations. Won't you come? Here I am. sees you God sees you God bless you come on come on come on come on come on won't you come Speak through.
last call. Come on, last call. Touch my heart, Lord. Don't miss this burning bush moment. Don't don't you miss this burning bush moment. Touch my heart. Touch my heart, Lord. God sees you. God sees you. Come on, come on. Give God a head clap. God sees you. Let's go and encourage some somebody else. Encourage somebody else. Come on, keep clapping. Encourage them. Encourage your sister. Encourage your brother. Come on. In this moment, won't you come? Come on, come on, come on. Where you at? Where you at? Someone else showed up thinking it was a regular Sunday. And I come by to tell you that you are absolutely right. It was a regular, ordinary Sunday, just like the last 52 Sundays you've been through in two previously. But what we've discovered today, that in those ordinary Sundays, God does extraordinary things. How was church normal? How was a sermon? Okay, regular. Amen, amen. Amen. Won't you give God a hand clap for those that have come?